Let's get into the subject that Ram said the least about. What we would do is give you the proof that he rather intentionally left out, or just like every other subject on this topic, just knows nothing about West Africa. But in Ram's video, he admits that over 1 million Hebrews fled in North Africa from the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. He claims that the others fled to Asia Minor and to Europe. Now first of all, we do know that the ones who were caught were sold into slavery and shipped to Europe and Asia. But no Hebrews fled to Europe and Asia. How do we know this? Number one, the Roman soldiers. In order for the Hebrews to flee into Asia and Europe, they would have to go north, directly into the teeth of the Roman Empire. Remember, Syria was controlled by Rome and their armies fought for Rome. Syrian province forces were directly engaged in the great Jewish revolt of 66 to 70 AD. In 66 AD, Celsius Gallus, the legate of Syria, brought the Assyrian army, reinforced by auxiliary troops, to restore order in Judea and quell the revolt. The legion, however, was ambushed and destroyed by Jewish rebels at the Battle of Beth Haran. As a result, that shocked the Roman leadership. The future emperor Vespasian was put in charge of subduing the Jewish revolt. In the summer of 69, Vespasian, with the Syrian Union supporting him, launched his bid to become Roman Emperor. He defeated this rival, Vitellius, and ruled as emperor for 10 years when he was succeeded by his son Titus. So if the Romans controlled Jerusalem and Syria, how could they flee north? Or better yet, why would they when the same Romans had no control or military presence south of them in Africa? Why would you flee from your enemies into your enemy's territory? Remember, the only province that Rome had in Africa was far northwest of them, clear across the continent to Tunisia. They could easily escape death by heading south. Also, because they were black Hebrews, if Rome came south into Africa, how could they find them or how could they be able to distinguish the Hebrew from the Hamite? Seeing through all scripture, that was a problem, even amongst black people. Number two, fleeing to Africa was something that the Hebrews always did. When it was prophesied that Judah was going to be taken into captivity, what did the Hebrews do? Jeremiah 26, verse 18 and 21. Micah the Moorshite prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house of the high places of forest. And when Jehoiakim the king, with all his mighty men and the princes, heard the words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid, and he fled and went into Egypt. Jeremiah 42, verses 13 through 16. But if ye say, you will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, and go to sojourn there, then it will come to pass that the sword which ye fear shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine, whereof you are afraid, shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. One reason the Hebrews will always flee south is because of the long relationships Israel had with Egypt and Cush. Remember, Solomon had relationships with Pharaoh's daughter, Egypt, and the Queen of Sheba, Cush, Arabia. The marriage of a king's daughter to a prince or a king is a sign of a union or partnership between two countries. 1 Kings 3, verse 1. And Solomon made a affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. 2 Chronicles 8, verse 11. And Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David into the house which he had built for her. For he said, My wife should not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy, whereof the ark of the Lord hath come. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 12. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, besides that which she brought him to the king. So she turned and went to her own land, she and her servant. This union with Egypt and Cush was so strong that during the siege of Nebuchadnezzar, Egypt even tried to fight and protect Judah from Babylon. Jeremiah 37 verses 1 and 5 through 7. And King Zedekiah the son of Josiah reigned instead of Coniah the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon made king in the land of Judah. 
Then Pharaoh's army came forth out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans besieged Jerusalem, heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus should you say to the king of Judah, That sent you unto me, inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt in their own land. Now, if Israel had allies who would fight for them, and also there were already Hebrews in Ethiopia and Egypt, plus the Roman garrisons were to the north of them, why would they flee north? In Ram's video, he's trying to infer that only a handful of Hebrews fled to Africa, and most of them to Europe, when the scriptures say something altogether different. Isaiah 11, 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover a remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. So we know that the Hebrews were brought to Assyria and to Shinar in the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. The other locations, Syria, Pathros, and Egypt, which is northern and southern Egypt, and Cush. First of all, Ram said that the one million were mostly just in Egypt. Remember, there were Hebrews in Cush before 70 AD, for one. Also notice how the Most High named Cush along with Egypt, where Ram said the Hebrews did not go. So if the Hebrews were already in Cush, which is East Africa, why would it be a stretch that they would migrate west? Well, one would say, God didn't say that they migrated west. So they didn't live in West Africa. Well, let's take a look and see if the Most High said anything about them being west of Cush. Zephaniah 3, verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, Cush, my supplants, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. And that day shalt thou not be ashamed of all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. But then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of thy holy mountain. Pretty interesting. It says that the dispersed of Israel are beyond the rivers of Cush. Hmm, I thought they was only in Europe and in Asia. Now let's take a closer look at this scripture. Beyond, Eber, a region across, on the opposite side. So let me get this straight. The Most High said that the dispersed of Israel are in the opposite side of the rivers of Cush. Wow. So what's the opposite side of East Africa? Hey. That will be West Africa. Get out of here. Who would have thought? But Ram said the Hebrews were not in West Africa. Hey, I wonder if anybody else knew about these Hebrews being in West Africa. In the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son, Titus, put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During the period of the military governors of Palestine, Many outrages and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing the Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor. The 16th century historian and traveler, Leon Africanus, was a Hebrew-speaking Jewish convert to Islam raised in a Jewish household by Jewish parents of Moroccan descent. Leon Africanus traveled extensively in Africa south of the Sahara, where he encountered innumerable black African Jewish communities. Let me say it again, where he encountered innumerable black African Jewish communities. Leon later converted to Catholicism, but remained interested in Jewish communities where he encountered throughout his travels in West Africa. This is a quote from his book, The Description of Africa. Albeit, they say that upon the Nihilus, or the Nile, you inhabit two great and populous nations. One of Jews toward the West, under a government of a mighty king. Leo Africanus, The Description of Africa, Volume 1, page 32. Ibn Kulahan, who lived in 13th century, a respected authority on Berber history testified that the black Jews of Western Sudan 
with whom he personally interacted. Also, the famous Muslim geographer El Drisi, born in Celta, Spain in the 12th century, wrote extensively about Jewish Negroes in the Western Sudan. Black Jews were fully integrated and achieved preeminence in many West African kingdoms. For instance, the Jews were believed to have settled in great West African empires such as Songhai, Mali, Ghana, and Kanembono empires. According to numerous accounts of contemporary visitors to the region, several rulers and administrators of the Songhai Empire were of Jewish origins until Askia Muhammad came to power in 1492 and decreed that all Jews either convert to Islam or leave the region. Some accounts place some West African Jewish community in the Ondo Forest of Nigeria, south of Timbuktu. This community maintained a Torah scroll as late as in the 1930s, written in Aramaic. They had been burnt into a parchment with a hot iron instead of ink, so it could not be changed. See, going Rafika, the quest of the lost ten tribes of Israel to the ends of the earth. This quote is from The Travels of Ludovico di Varmita in Egypt, Syria, Arabia Desert, and Arabia Felix in Persia, India, and Ethiopia AD, 1503, 1508. At the end of eight days, we found a mountain which appeared to be 10 or 12 miles in circumference, in which mountain there dwell four or 5,000 Jews who go naked and are in height five or six spans and have a feminine voice and are more black than any other color. They live entirely on the flesh of sheep and eat nothing else. They are circumcised and confess that they are Jew. These quotes are from the earth and its inhabitants, the universal geography by Alice Rakulis. The Mandingans were now broken up into many rival petty states or excellent husbandmen, but displayed their remarkable talents chiefly as traders. They have been compared to the Sirocles, the Jews of West Africa. This quote is from Ebu's Hero Exiles from Israel, Amazing Facts and Revelations. The first British explorers who met the Ebu's of Nigeria were quick to identify them as a branch of Hebrews, based 1938 and so simply referred to them as Hebrews, Hebos, Ebos, and later Ebus. But during the time of the first documentation of the history of the Ebus, the early Ebus, who knew very little or no English, following the pronunciation of the new version of their original name by their colonial masters, deviated from the name Ivite Agluri, from Ivert, Ifite, or Ihite, and began to use the popular new and foreign language of the colonialists, and so referred to themselves as Hebo, a corruption of Hebrew or an accepted to be called Hebo, Ebo or Ebu as a way of associating themselves with the emergent new culture of their colonial master. Ebos, Hebrew exiles from Israel, Amazing Facts and Revelations, Chapter 7, Jewish Origin of the Ebus, Perspectives from History and Divine Revelation. This quote is from African History in Documents, Volume 1, Western African History, by Robert O. Collins. The inhabitants of Bonnie when I author last visited that port, I counted to about 3,000. They were a mixture of Igbo or Hebo in the brass tribes. The Igbos, who are also from a neighboring country, have already been spoken of as a superior race. The king of New Calabar and the neighborhood and Papal king of Bonnie were both of Igbo descent, of which also are a mass of the natives and the number of the slaves from the Igbo country which throughout the existence of Bonnie amounted to perhaps three-fourths of the whole export. It is calculated no fear that 16,000 of these people alone were annually exported from Bonnie within the 20 years ending in 1820. So that including 50,000 were taken within the same period from new and old Calabar. The aggregate export of the Igbo alone was not short of 370,000. Anglican missionary G.T. Baxter was so sure the Ebus were of Israel, he told other missionaries to familiarize themselves with the Old Testament law so as to better witness to the Ebu, because the Ebu lived like the ancient Israelites. This is a quote from G.T. Baxter's book, Among the Ebus of Nigeria. The Ebu country lies within the recognized Negro Belt, and the people there bear the main characteristics of that stock. 
there are certain customs which rather point to a Levitic influence at a more or less remote period. This is suggested in the underlying ideas concerning sacrifice and in the practice of circumcision. The language also bears several interesting parallels with Hebrew idioms. So where is Western Sudan? At one point the area of Sudan stretched from East Ethiopia to West Africa. At that time it was not called Sudan but Soyudan meaning land of Judah. In the latter centuries this area became known by the slave traders as Negro land. This is where the use of the term Negro originated. During Ram's documentary he constantly pounds the idea that the Negro is a Kushite. He even denies the Zodafrin Bible dictionary which states that the Negro did not descend from Ham. So let's take a look at the definition of the word Negro. Negro, a member of a dark skinned group of peoples who were originally native to Africa south of the Sahara. The word Negro was adopted from Spanish and Portuguese and was first recorded in the mid 16th century. Notice it says Sub Saharan African. But when we look at a map of the territories of the sons of Ham in Africa, Foot, Kush, and Mizraim, they are all northern African or northern Saharan areas, just as listed in the Bible. But Sub-Saharan Africa was not inhabited by any of the sons of Ham, nor mentioned in the scripture, as we see in these maps. So who are these mystery blacks who show up in these areas? Egypt, Ethiopia, and Libya are all mentioned in scriptures as the original nations of Africa. But no mention of Soudan or the Congo, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Chad, etc. That's why the word Negro wasn't adopted until the 16th century. So we see that the territory of Sub-Saharan Africa or the Negro was not the territory of the indigenous peoples of the nations of Africa, Libya, Egypt, and Kush, which proves the Zadorian Bible Dictionary's claim. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, probably born about 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood, he became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. As we see again, the areas beyond the rivers of Cush, as the scripture says, is where the Hebrews were and are. This is the sub-Saharan areas of Africa, which the term Negro was designated. Even some of the countries, cities, and tribes in those areas are named with Hebrew names. Chad, for instance, Genesis 46 and 10. And the sons of Simeon, Jamul and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanish woman. The word Chad is taken from the word Ohad, the grandson of Simeon. Also in the country of Chad, there are areas such as Gerar, who is the son of Benjamin. Genesis 46 and 21. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela, and Beecher, and Ashbel, and Gera, and Naaman, and E, and Rosh, Mupim, and Hupim, and Ar, the Salmit region of Chad also. Salma was the son of Caleb. First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 50 through 51. These are the son of Caleb, the son of Hur, the firstborn of Aphrata, Shobal, the father of Kirajerim, Salma, the father of Bethlehem, Harpath, the father of Beth Greater, or in the country of Senegal, the capital, Dakar, which Dakar was the father of one of the twelve officers who oversaw Israel under Solomon. First Kings chapter 4 verses 7 through 9. And Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household. Each man his month in a year made provisions. And these are their names. The son of Hur in Mount Ephraim, the son of Dekar in Makaz, and in Shabim, and Beth Shemesh, and Elon Hathan, or in Ghana, the Ashanti tribe, which Ashan was the son of Judah. Ashanti meaning the people of Ashan. Joshua, chapter 15, verse 1 and 42. This then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zen southward, the uttermost part of the south coast, Libna and Ether and Ashan. Also because of the dual kingdoms of Cush in Africa and Arabia, the Hebrews who didn't flee to Egypt fled south to Dedan, a province of Cush, 
eventually settling in Yemen before crossing the Red Sea into South Africa. Concentrated in the shadow of the South Pansberg Mountains in the far north of South Africa. To the casual observer, they look and live much like any other traditional Southern African community. But if you scratch below the surface, there are some intriguing differences. Here I am in South Africa, and there are these men wearing skull caps and tali shoulder wraps. You would see this in any synagogue in America or Israel, but I never thought I'd see it here in South Africa. I want to find out how these people seem to have Jewish customs. Samuel Moetti is president of the Lemba Cultural Association. Pleasure. So I'll be honest, I, I came into this village and the first word I heard was shalom, yes. a Hebrew word. Yes. How is that possible? How is it that the Lemba is speaking Hebrew? The Lembas are the original Hebrews and they were scattered, as you know and they crossed into Africa. So they were scattered all over. So in South Africa, in many parts of South Africa, you find the Lembas who are actually Hebrews. Hebrews, so the Lembas claim to be descendants of ancient Israelites? Not claim, they are. They are? They are. Okay. We are the original African Hebrew. We are scattered all over. Can you give me a few examples of some of the Jews? Yes, we don't partake of pork. Okay. We don't mix milk with meat. It sounds to me like the Lemba have a, a unique culture surrounded by others who do not practice the same way. That is correct. We always believe that the Jewish people who live all over the world are our brothers because we come from the same root. Could it be that the Lemba are a lost tribe of Israel? To answer perhaps the Lemba's oral history handed down over the generations can help us make a connection to the lost tribes of Israel. The Lemba story goes like this. Thousands of years ago, they were forced out of Israel and settled in a place called Sena, which is believed to be the present day Yemen. There, they lived as traders and craftsmen until war or natural disaster pushed them across the Red Sea and into Africa. Then began a slow migration south. Along the way, according to the Lemba, they built great stone cities. It's a claim that's fascinating. Himmler is convinced that Lemba ancestors did indeed come from the Middle East. I'm excited to get back to the Lemba to see what they make of this. And I've got the perfect opportunity. It's the Lemba's annual festival, and I've been invited. It's hard to believe that these people, who to the casual observer look just like the other African communities they live among, actually do have DNA passed down from Middle Eastern forefathers. This proves that when it comes to race, looks really can be deceiving. This annual festival is a chance for the oral history and traditional songs of the Lemba to be passed on to the next generation. This song tells the story of the Lemba's journey all the way from Israel to South Africa. Having traced this journey, I'm eager to hear what Samuel Moetti thinks about the DNA evidence. So the genetic testing actually proved to the doubters what you and your forefathers have been saying for generations. That must be exciting news. It is. I'll be honest, I hadn't heard of the Lemba. I knew very little about the people. But having spent time making the journey from Jerusalem down through Zimbabwe, having spent time here at this festival, seeing what your people are all about, I can only sum it up in one word, and that's shalom. Shalom. We've seen how science has backed up the claims of the Lemba in the face of years of doubt and prejudice. The archaeological clues, the DNA evidence, and the Lemba's own oral history add up to a very convincing argument. It reminds me that first impressions can often be misleading. It was hard to believe that a tribe of black Africans could be the descendants of ancient Israelites. But that's exactly what they appear to be. Brother and sister, they are there. We are not lost. We are scattered. We are original Hebrew. Sub-Saharan West Africa is an interesting place, especially a little place called the Slave Coast, in which the slave traders called Negro Land. As you can see, the area of the slave coast was called Wahida. 
And if you look right above it, in English are the words Kingdom of Judah. This is the port where the so-called African or Negro American was taken. Also to the British Islands, South America, and Europe. This area was called Kingdom of Judah. Well, maybe they just called it that, like a nickname or something. But actual Hebrews didn't live there. Well, let's take a look. This is from Press and Bulletin's magazine. Language doc from the Society of Geography. Wahida, also called Fida, Huida, Uida, Judah or Judah, is an ancient city frequented since the 16th century by Portuguese slave traders who gave it its name. Its inhabitants were said were Judaic and were viewed as the remnant of the scattered tribes of Israel. This quote is from Creole New Orleans, Race and Americanization by Arnold R. Hirsch and Joseph Logston. Between June 1719 and January 1731, 16 slave trading ships arrived in Louisiana from the Senegal region. Six ships came from Judah, Wida, a slave trading post. Between February 1726 and January 1731, 12 slave ships from Senegal landed. 3,259 slaves at Belize at the mouth of the Mississippi River. During the same period, one ship from Judah landed 464 slaves at the same port. The African slaves brought to the Chesapeake during the 18th century came mainly from the Bright of Bafara and were heavily Igbo. Here's a couple of more quotes from the Earth and its inhabitants, the Universal Geography. East of the Great Popo begins the Dahomey territory, guarded by the important town of Gluia. Known to Europeans by various names, Fida, Havida, Waida, Wida. The old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be the Jews. <laughs> During the flourishing days of the slave trade from 16 to 18, thousand were annually transported from a Judah, as the Portuguese called this place, which at that time had a population of 35,000. Part of the local trade is in the hands of the Mavumas, a people of grave and solemn aspect with intelligent eyes, straight or even eloquent nose, whose pronounced Semitic type have earned them the Portuguese designation of Judos Pretos, or Black Jew. I don't know how much more proof you need, but I'm going to give you some more. Who by chance financed and organized these Portuguese slave traders who discovered the kingdom of Judah on the slave coast? Meet Aaron Lopez, born Duarte Lopez. He was a Jewish Portuguese slave trader. Through his very commercial ventures, he became the wealthiest person in Newport, Rhode Island, in British America in 1761 and 1762. Lopez expanded his trade beyond the North American coastline by 1757. He had major interests in the West Indian slave trade. He also sent ships to Europe and the Canary Islands between 1761 and 1774. As we established earlier, it was the Murano Jews who controlled the slave trade, which some were Portuguese and Dutch. It was written on their maps that the slave coast was actually the Judeans of Israel, or Yehuda. So that would mean that they would have some info about the Sub-Saharan Africans, right? This is a quote from Stephen Jacobs, European Jewish historian, from his book, The Hebrew Heritage of Black Africa, fully documented. Black Americans are now in a position as never before in modern history to rediscover and reclaim, if they wish, a heritage which has profoundly influenced world history and mankind, the Hebrew heritage of black Africa. So since we've established, without dispute, that not only did the true Israelites flee into sub-Saharan Africa, but that the scripture also agrees that the dispersed of Israel are beyond the rivers of Cush and from there were transported as slaves into every nation not for the first time but actually the third time around the first time and the second times were in the known world the third time into the new world and seeing that it was by the witness of two or three that every word is established according to scripture that would be right on the nose now the last thing we need to consider is the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews location. Since 98% of the people who claim to be Jews are self-proclaimed Ashkenazi Jews. Well, who was Ashkenaz? Was he one of the sons of Jacob? No. Actually, he's the grandson of Japheth, the ancestor of Germany, a European country. 
So how can the ancestor of Germany be Hebrew when it's the Hebrews who descend from Shem? Well, one might say that they didn't descend from Ashkenaz, but rather they were just Jews who were living in the area of Ashkenaz. Well, then you have a bigger problem. If 98% of all the Jews in the world were in Germany or Russia, since 98% of the world's Jews are Ashkenazi, then how could any Jews be scattered anywhere else? Doesn't the Bible say they would go captive into every nation? Also, if almost 100% of all the Jews in the world were in Germany, why would the Bible say they were in Cush, Egypt, and Assyria, and Arabia? Was there not one Jew in those areas? Also, if every Jew was in Germany or Russia, why does the Bible not even mention them places as places they were scattered to? Not in a single prophecy. Also, let's not leave out the 2% of so-called Sephardic Jews. Who are they? 2 Kings 17 verses 24-25 and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Kuhath, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from, catch it, Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria, instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria, and they dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they fear not the Lord, therefore the Lord sent lions among them and slew some of them. Strong's H 56.16 Sepharvaim, meaning the two Sephiroths, Sepharjim or Sepharim. As you can see, that the Sephardic, who are the Sepharim, are not Hebrews. Plus, also, Sephardic comes from Spain. Another nation not listed as a nation that the Hebrews were scattered to. No Spain, no Germany. Yet according to them, 100% of the world's Jews were in Spain and Germany. Why? Pretty simple. 98% of the world's Jews are Ashkenazi. We're in Germany. And the rest, the 2% are Sephardic. That makes 100%. I didn't realize that Spain and Germany is counted as every nation. Or that Spain and Germany is also called Egypt, Cush, Assyria, Babylon, and Ethiopia, for that matter. As we have concluded in this video, there is not one single shred of evidence or any biblical prophecies that point to the Ashkenazi Jews or the descendants of Japheth as Hebrews from the tribe of Judah, as they falsely claim. Yet historically, archaeologically, and the Bible all point to the Negro as the exiled tribe of Judah, as even confirmed by the Ashkenazis themselves. In conclusion, we pray that Ram or Reformed Apologetics Ministries come into the knowledge of the truth and cease from propagating false information, hopefully ignorantly and not intentionally, about the biblical history of our ancestors. We at Rebirth of a Nation, I'd like to thank TOTO, this is Dr. Guide MC, for the factual contributions to our video. Shalom and shalom. You Israelites, you black people in this country, what do you say about them? You call them animals? I call them inferior. I call you slaves. We turn you into slaves, and when we didn't need them no more, we kick you out of Israel. And, I mean, out of Egypt, but out of Africa. We sold you to America, and that's where we want you to stay. We don't want you to